Um, what's, uh, oh, thank you, yes, we are recording this. Um, so if anybody has to leave early or if you just wanna review things, we'll have, we'll make the video recording available. Um, one of the things that's, um, that I really do like in the Zoom world is um, the ability to have so many people from all across the country here today, which is really fun um, to connect with you all um, and get some conversations going that we might not have been able to if we were kind of limited to, um, to an Arizona audience. So um, because we have a fairly large group and we um, are worried that we may not, we want to save some time for conversation um, towards the end. But um, in the interest of maybe getting to know each other just a little bit, um, we were wondering if you feel comfortable, if you would add your, um, your location and your organization in the chat, just so others have a sense of, um, of who's here and, um, and maybe there's opportunities to, to kind of make some connections and um, across, uh, through this webinar. Great, um, and hopefully um, everybody can hear me okay and see my screen before I get started. Great, okay. As all of you who have been uh, living the Zoom reality know, it's not that easy to uh, see the chat while you're talking, but um, Gigi and I will be sharing those duties. So if you do have a question um, or something comes up, one of us will have an eye on the chat the whole time. Um, okay, well, in, in that spirit, I'll, uh, I'll start by, um, we'll do some introductions and then we'll get started. Um, I'm Allison Meadow. I'm an associate research professor at uh, University of Arizona in the Arizona Institutes for Resilience. Gigi and I together have, um, have created a small program within the institutes called Research Impacts and Evaluation. We also have in common um, uh, our affiliation with the Climate Assessment for the Southwest, which is based here at University of Arizona. Um, you may know it as CLIMAS. Um, I am also affiliated with the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is a USGS, Department of Interior funded center. Um, and I work with the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center as well, which is based out of the University of Washington. And I know we have a couple of people from there today. Um, and Gigi, do you wanna introduce yourself? <laughs> Um, sure, I think I think you captured um, my affiliations, but uh, I will say I'm Gigi Owen. I am a research scientist with the Climate Assessment for the Southwest program at the University of Arizona, um, and I'm really excited to uh, dive into this with all of you. Great. Um, well, thanks. So our goal today is really um, we want to present and walk through a process that, um, that you can use to incorporate the idea of societal impacts into your research. So sort of the, you know, impacts in the real world, impacts in the communities that you're working with, um, and some ideas about how to document um, and, and describe those impacts so that you can communicate them effectively to, to others who might be interested in the kind of work that you're doing. Um, a lot of this is based on um, a guidebook that Gigi and I put together recently, and we're going to provide um, a link to that. Um, so if you want to take a look at it, it gets a little bit more in depth, um, but we wanted to provide an overview and hopefully have some time um, to have some discussion about it as well. Okay. Um, Quick overview of the talk today. We're going to um, describe and talk about what are societal impacts when we say these this word. What do we mean? Um, how do we get to those through the, um, through our research? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why we should document these things, um, what they can be used for, what this kind of case study or this kind of documentation approach can be effective for, um, and then really dive into um, how. To do this, um, what kinds of uh, what kinds of work we can do, how to plan for this, and, and how to document this kind of work. Okay, so the big question: What are societal impacts? The way that we've defined them, um, and and many of our colleagues in the literature are, is that um, this is the way your research or the process of conducting your research has influenced the world beyond academia. We sort of are taking for granted that um, you all have, um, have great impact within your disciplines and within academia. That's, that's a lot of the training that we receive. We know how to write the papers and, and do those research processes. So, um, you know, develop new theories, write those papers, uh, 
create new data in the world. Um, but what we want to talk about today is this is about having impact more directly on the communities and the environment in which we're working in and how to incorporate those impacts into our academic research efforts, make them part of the work that we're doing. Um, many of you might already be familiar with things like the broader impact statements that are required um, by NSF, National Science Foundation projects. This is a similar idea, but we're reaching beyond uh, the uh, NSF focus, and we're really hoping that we're reaching beyond the requirements of any one funder to really change the way that we're thinking about how our research benefits society. We are going to focus today on a set of a category, um, a way of think, talking about our research impacts that we've divided into four to five categories. Um, and we'll just introduce this so that, you know, because we'll, we'll keep calling back to these as we go. We've got instrumental impacts. This is when your research has led to tangible changes in plans, decisions, or policies. And you can draw that line between the work that you've done and, and something that has really changed within a community, within an organization. You can see a change in, in decisions, policies, practices. Conceptual impacts, these are a little harder to, uh, to pick up on, but they're really important. This is when your research has con contributed to changes in people's knowledge about or awareness of an issue, that sort of light bulb idea. Okay, people are getting this more. They're really digging in and understanding this issue. Capacity building impacts is when your research has contributed to enhancing skills, expertise, or maybe the resources of an organization that you're working with. Um, we can think about this in terms of um, building students, um, any, any kind of capacity building additional training that your work can contribute to. Connectivity impacts is when your research leads to new or strengthened relationships or partnerships or networks that and this is the important part, endure beyond the life of the project. We want to see that this isn't something that ends on the day that the funding ends, but that we're starting to really build some connections that endure. And the really big one that I think we all got into this line of work, most likely that we want to be able to do, these socio-environmental impacts, really making changes in social or ecological systems, improvements in health and well-being, maybe changes and improvements in ecosystem structure and function that really result from actions that occurred because of your research. So those big change goals, those big socio-environmental impacts are really important and really good, and we should want to see our work as part of finding a solution to those big problems. Those big changes often take a really long time to achieve, and they are rarely the result of just one project. So we're going to focus today on those top four categories of impact, because these we tend to see more in a short to midterm, more like a project scale. These are easier to pick up on. They're great indicators that your work is likely to have and likely to influence those big changes, but they're things that you can be documenting and you can be keeping um, an eye on at the, at the sort of temporal scale of your project. Um, we would, you know, we'd like to say these categories might not capture every single type of impact that your work has had or that others' work has had. Um, but after a lot of uh, wrestling with these, we feel like they're really pretty comprehensive and they're a really good point for a uh, starting point for this framework. So, um, and another really important point is these categories can and do interact with each other. They're not hierarchical, they support each other, they influence each other. Um, so, we, you know, while we all would like to see that our work has influenced policy and practice, in order to get there, we probably need some of these other things. And they, they work together to get us to those big goals. So we don't want to, we want to move away from a hierarchical look at this to, um, to just uh, recognizing that they're all important. Um, there are some other categories and frameworks out there. We think they all work together really well. We're um, draw from ones that make sense to you. Ask us if you're not seeing yourself reflected in, um, in today's, in the categories that we walk through today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Gigi to dig into what we really mean here. Yeah, so we're gonna go through some examples of what these categories look like in practice. Um, so first off, uh, this example states 
that we worked with the staff of the local wildlife management agency and introduced a new sampling technique that they hadn't used before. They told us it was more accurate than the method they usually used, and they changed their protocol to incorporate this new technique. So here in this statement, it demonstrates kind of a, a combination of, of two different categories. One is capacity building. So the agency staff learned and practiced this new sampling technique and also an instrumental application because they then incorporated this new skill into their regular management practices. So in the, um... In the connectivity category, um, in 2015, utility employees identified several climate and environmental risks that could impact their operations. Our research team provided them with tailored data and analyses to address their concerns. A year later, utility employees contacted us again to propose collaborating to develop scenarios for carbon reduction. This has turned into an ongoing new project. So this is a great example of connectivity. We worked together. We stayed in touch, they called us back again, and now we're working on something new. Um, it's really important when we think about these societal impacts that we think about how we establish relationships built around trust, built around the credibility of the work that we're doing. And it's a really nice indicator to have somebody call you back after and say, hey, we, we liked what we did before, we trusted what we did before. So this is a really nice indicator that your work is trusted and is more likely to be picked up and make those big changes later. So another example of capacity building. Um, in this example, three graduate students from backgrounds often underrepresented in STEM fields participated in a project. They gained data collection, analysis, and project management skills, participated in the writing of four academic papers, and all three were accepted into postdoctoral programs in this field. So this fits under capacity building because the students' skills, expertise, and also future employment opportunities were all expanded through project participation. Okay, conceptual uses, this is that awareness, greater understanding. Results from our paleoclimate project conducted with a federal agency provided new insight into how temperatures impact stream flow and drought in the Colorado River Basin. During subsequent meetings, water managers explicitly discussed how they could apply this insight into new techniques for water management. And what makes this a great example is we had a new idea introduced, folks talked about it, folks worked through it during a project, and they were demonstrating that they really understood it um, and saw some utility in it because they're thinking about how they can apply this in, um, in a new context. So in this example, we uh, this talk demonstrates the socio-environmental impact. Um, so the example states that we worked with local residents to develop a reforestation plan using findings from previous research. The residents got funding from the city for the project and they planted over 200 trees. Over the last three years, residents noticed that several bird and mammal species had repopulated the area and the reforestation plan is bringing back biodiversity to the region. Um, so here we see socio-environmental impact occurring because of this increased biodiversity over time that began with implementing this reforestation plan. So as Allison pointed out earlier, most of these socio-environmental impacts occur over a longer period of time than some of these other impact categories that we just went through. Um, so unless you've also had kind of a longer term monitoring or evaluation system in place, you might not even see these types of longer term impacts as they often extend beyond the timeframe of your project. But they're still uh, there, they're capturable um, and uh, important. So how do we get to societal impacts through our research? There are several different pathways from uh, that connect research to societal impact, but they typically flow through this general pattern. So number one is key, you do good research. <laughs> um, number two, that research then connects to society. Number three, societal partners use that research. And number four, that research changes something for a person, organization, community, or ecosystem. Um, and the main point of divergence 
um, in this pathway and it revolves around this point number two in how that research is connecting to society. So uh, it can connect through indirect interactions with society. So for example, someone may find your research in a book or an academic journal, a report through the news media or online and then use it and apply it to their own needs. What we focus on more and more of our examples um, is these direct interactions with society, um, engaged scholarship, collaborative research. Um, there are definitely more than one ways of effectively connecting with folks and getting your research into use. So these are just some of the examples. Um, you know, you can have this direct engagement um, by uh, doing joint field work, visiting this, you know, doing field, visiting field sites together, collecting data together, um, engaging on the data analysis, presenting your findings to the public can be um, a great way to get to get that out there. Um, you might be asked to provide expert testimony um, and you might find um, opportunities to, to really um, directly engage throughout the research project, sharing data um, with anyone who is interested in, um, in the work that you're doing. So what, what we wanna emphasize is, these is this is that direct um, working together, collaborating during all or parts of the research. Um, and there's a lot of good evidence out there that this is actually the most effective way to move from research into use of your research because it engages the people that are going to use this. It engages resource managers or decision makers, municipal, um, uh, municipal employees, um, they're there, they understand what's going on and they're, it's more. It's easier for them to take up and use the research and they trust it more because they've been part of the process. Okay, this is one slight caveat here. Um, it is more than likely that your research is just gonna be one of several factors that influence a change. Um, it's really rare that, uh, that we get sort of like one research project changes, you know, one really big thing um, changes something dramatically. So um, you'll note this little winding, uh, winding road metaphor. Um, your research is probably pointing people in new directions, but the road is going to wind because there are several factors that influence it. So you might start with a research question, you and your research, you and your partners are going to engage, you're going to talk, you're going to kind of refine that question based on their needs and their interests. Um, the process of doing this, or maybe your research findings is probably going to have those conceptual impacts, helping people view the issue in a new way. Maybe this understanding leads them to read more about it, get even more information from different sources. It might lead them to recognize the need for additional training or new skills within their organization to, that are going to address this problem. Maybe they have to go someplace else to get that training. Um, there's probably going to need to be some changes in policy within the organization that allow them to, to adopt new practices. Um, so there's going to be some organizational context issues that come into play. And all of this does take some time um, and a lot of effort on the part of the partners that you're working with. Um, they need to lead some internal discussions. They need to make, you know, they need to make sure that that new training takes place. They need to, you know, work on those policy changes. So remember that they're really key to this process. Um, they know how to make change within their organization. But just because your research is not the sole factor in this doesn't mean that it's not um, worthwhile documenting. It's really important. You have played an important role. Contributing to a positive impact is really a result worth describing, and it helps us understand how we get impacts and change, um, how many different sources of information, how many people need to be involved, etc. So um, just because it's not the sole factor doesn't mean that it's not an incredibly important one. Okay. Why should we do this? Why should we document our societal interactions and impacts? Um, hopefully you're all here because you're interested in crafting your research to engage with and have a positive influence on our communities, our environment. Um, I'm guessing you wouldn't come to this kind of talk if that wasn't your goal, but there are some other good reasons um, that to make this approach part of a research practice. Um, first, because 
funders are really starting to take this seriously and really think about how federal funds are being used to benefit society and our environment more directly than it has been in the past. Um, as I said at the beginning, many of you might be familiar with um, National Science Foundation and their broader impacts statements. We just listed um, some of the examples of broader impacts goals that NSF is looking for. Um, again, this is one funder, but, but in many ways they've been out in front of this effort. So we wanted to, to acknowledge and recognize that. Um, Really excitingly, in the last few years, um, more applied research agencies are getting a lot more sophisticated in their understanding of impacts and their interest in demonstrating them through funded projects. So just a few other examples of agencies both here and abroad that are starting to say, hey, we really, really want to see collaboration with users. We really want to see you talk about the impacts that you're having um, in, the, in the real world. So it's starting to grow. It means that there's more opportunities to get funding for this kind of work. Um, some other reasons um, I mentioned before, you might be asked to um, explain your research to policymakers or you know, provide some expert testimony. Um, having a way to really talk about it and summarize your work succinctly and feel really confident that you know what kinds of changes um, have occurred, it can be really helpful. Um, same thing if you're asked to come to a public meeting and talk to members of the, of the public and of the community, being able to really summarize and demonstrate to them the kind of um, effects that your work is having can be a really good way to build trust um, and have them really um, understand the kind of work that you're doing. Um, and finally, you um, are probably wanting to demonstrate to your dean or to your director, or your boss, what how great your work is and the kind of um, the kind of excellent work that you're doing, the kind of effort that goes into generating um, these kinds of impacts. This can this approach can give you, um, I think, a little more confidence and some um, some language to use in those discussions. Um, there is also, this is pretty exciting, a really clear movement in higher education toward a recognition of a broader range of professional achievements, um, including engaged research and societal impact. Um, really notably, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine are talking about this. How do we change promotion and tenure policies um, to incorporate more engaged work, um, more focus on applied research and community engagement? Um, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities released a really strong statement in 2019 in support of public impact research, exactly the kinds of things that we're talking about today and encouraging universities to engage in that, um, partly as a way to really rebuild some of the trust that seems to have been lost between higher education and our communities. Um, and finally, oh, there we go. Um, our colleagues in Europe are way out in front on this, and I um, I really suggest everybody, um, if you're interested in this, Google this initiative, Room for Everyone's Talent, which it comes out of a coalition of universities in the Netherlands that is really thinking about how to make significant changes to how academics are evaluated and the kind of uh, work and uh, kind of recognition our work gets. Okay. Um, so now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of this. We are going to walk through the framework um, and demonstrate sort of how to build your own case study around the impacts that uh, that your work is having. Um, this approach relies really heavily on qualitative data collection. Partly that's because that's the tradition that Gigi and I both come out of, um, but partly because um, we've really found that a case study approach is more appropriate for understanding impact and incorporating evaluation findings back into program um, operations and decisions. Um, our, the colleagues, who I said, who are out in front of this in Europe are using this kind of qualitative case study approach. It's a really great way to find those deeper connections and understanding between what happened in a research project, the collaborations that led to that. Um, it gives you a chance to really dig through and find some important details and provides a systematic way to collect multiple types of evidence. All right. Great, so now we're gonna walk through the process um, of how to link research processes to impact. Um, so in the guidebook that Allison mentioned earlier that we'll provide a link to, 
Um, we do talk about this process in two main ways. Um, so we go through planning for societal impacts through project development and design. So this would be using this in the early stages of a research project. Um, and then we also walk through how to assess and document societal impacts after a project has ended. And so they use similar structures and questions, but um, are slightly different in scope and purpose. So today we're gonna focus on the process of documenting impact after the project has ended. Um, the framework, as uh, if you are at all familiar with action logic models, um, our framework is based on that format. Um, and so for each of these steps, for both of the two different processes, we include specific questions and directions to help people think through and outline their impacts. Um, so. Did uh, I jump ahead first, too fast? <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Okay. Um, so we're gonna, yeah, we're just gonna walk through uh, an example piece by piece. So, um, or, or we're gonna actually go through the overall structure and then go through an example piece by piece. Um, so we start with the question, what societal problem did you aim to address in your research? Second, how did you try to address it? So what actions and activities did you do? How did you engage with your partners? Third, we, uh, what were your outputs? So the tangible products or things that you produced in your project. And then at this point, it may be helpful to link your activities to their associated outputs. So for example, did a workshop connect to the publication of a workshop report? Next, we look at impacts. So here you'll see the four, um, the four types of impacts that we introduced at the beginning of our presentation. So again, conceptual impacts, new knowledge or awareness gained, connectivity, partnerships are estab uh, established or strengthened, capacity building, skills and expertise were strengthened or acquired, and instrumental impacts, the direct applications of your research. So here it's important to think about what changed and then also to call out for whom did things change. Then you're gonna go back and link your specific activities and outputs to their associated impacts if that is relevant. Then you will uh, go back and document some of the inputs and that enabled you to conduct your research. So these are things like the resources you needed and the skills needed and existing relationships. You'll also go through the local context in which your research took place. So thinking about the social and environmental and political factors that either facilitated or inhibited your research. And you could connect these, these impacts back to some of these enabling factors. And this part is mostly helpful during project reflection and learning lessons to bring with you into future research projects. Um, and then finally, you can see if and how the impact addressed the societal problem. Okay, um, so we're going to walk through um, just quickly to give you a sense of what, are, what an example of this might look like. Um, so we want to start with what societal problem did you aim to address in your research? And we want this to be pretty short and, um, and to the point. So a couple of sentences. Um, really important, this statement is going to be different from a research question. This is about what the big societal or environmental problem is. Your research is, is a way that you address it, but that's not your big problem statement. So in ours, we've got a tropical storm caused major flooding in a neighborhood of the city of Floodsville. Ocean water breached the existing coastal wall, leading the city's planners and emergency managers to question whether they had the most accurate projections for sea level rise. They wanted up-to-date sea level rise information so they could make better informed policies and decisions for the future of the city. Um, Sometimes this problem statement, which is different from a research question, can be tricky. So we wanted to just provide a little bit of guidance. And here we're really pulling from, um, from others' work, but um, some really nice examples. A problem statement. Ask yourself, what problem do you aim to solve? Again, not, not the research question, but what, what are you trying to do within, uh, within your community or within the environment? Is this really a problem outside of the academic literature? Is this a problem for people, for the environment, or is this uh, something that, that sort of exists in our little world? <laughs> um, what will solving this look like, and who is this a problem for? And then 
finally, like a problem statement is one or two sentences that you want to explain the problem that your research is going to address. Um, you want to outline the negative points of the current situation, explain why it matters. That gets back to like, who is this problem for? Um, and, um, and then this can be a great communication tool, getting buy-in and support from others. If you're working about, if you're writing about work that you've already done, just change all of these to the past tense when you're doing your reflections. Great, so then walking through the actions. So what actions did you take to address this flooding issue? Here you're going to state your methods briefly to give a sense of the kind of research that you did and then provide a description of your approach to societal engagement. So here, scientific activities included data collection and analysis about sea level rise projections and tailoring them to the right spatial uh, and temporal scales for the city. Um, engagement activities included four meetings with city planners and emergency managers. Um, you, uh, uh, you had regular email and phone conversations with city officials, planners, and managers. You attended community association meetings about flood and flood relief. Um, and then throughout the two-year project, you updated planners and emergency managers and community members about your progress with your current uh, data and analyses. And you also provided city officials with detailed maps and summaries of your analysis. Okay, so what did you produce? These are those outputs, and we want to focus here on those tangible outputs. So something sort of physical that came out of your project. So um, big picture research findings. We found that the city's current seawall was not high enough for the current sea levels or for future levels. We provided estimates to inform the height of a new wall. We produced downscale climate projections for the greater, greater Floodsville region maps of projected sea level rise in Greater Floodsville. Um, and the maps comply with FEMA data standards for easy use in planning documents. Um, the presentation summarizing the research findings were provided to city planners. And we produced a two page fact sheet aimed at a community audience summarizing the research and addressing questions and concerns raised by community members at meetings. So we've got a number of tangible research outputs. So again, this is that stop. Don't just don't just list these out, but really think about what were the connections between the activities or between the outputs and the kinds of impacts that you saw um, at the end of the project. That's what we're going to get to here. So in this example, um, we had the a fictional example, conceptual impacts. Um, you as a researcher received emails from city council um, about their increased understanding of the risks of sea level rise. So demonstrating that awareness, that greater understanding of the issue. Community members were asking increasingly in-depth questions about the impacts they might face um, and use this to think about ways that they would prepare for floods in the future. Um, connectivity impacts, new relationships were built with city planners and community members, existing relationships strengthened with emergency managers, planners are inviting the researchers to, uh, to work on a new project together, and get, continuing to get requests from the city for presentations about this work. Capacity building. In this situation, we're not talking about students building capacity, we're talking about the partners building capacity. Um, a city council member using a PowerPoint presentation files to give a presentation to another city, demonstrating a lot of facility with the materials, demonstrating confidence and talking about this. Um, and then the floods bill city government giving staff members time to learn GIS skills to map this project. So this project sort of leading to a new skill set for, um, for city employees. And finally, we sort of hinted at this, some instrumental impacts. The projection maps were used in the city's new multi-hazard mitigation plan, and the plan was accepted by the Federal Emergency Management Association, uh, Administration, excuse me. <laughs> Great. So then the next key part of this process is to understand not only what changed, but specifically for whom. So, um, you know, in terms of connectivity, we have uh, community members, city planners, and emergency managers all strengthened their ties with one another. In addition, you and your research team were impacted as your ties with these groups were also created and strengthened. They have new connections with you. 
for capacity building, city government officials were impacted in many ways. Uh, so one example was that the Floodsville city government gave staff members time to learn the GIS skills to map the flood projections and these individuals learned a new skill set that they could apply elsewhere. Um, for instrumental impacts, the city government officials changed their plans for hazard mitigation and now have a new strategy to implement to address this problem. And then conceptual impacts. So both City council and community members gained new knowledge about flooding issues. And maybe you know this because at the community meetings, residents asked you increasingly in-depth questions about the impacts that they might face and then used this information to think about new ways that they would be preparing for floods. And so again, thinking, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of ways to think through this question of for whom things changed or improved because of your research. Um, some common categories of, of people that uh, may be impacted include stakeholders, your research partners, or these students, um, general public, residents. Um, going through this part of the process also offers opportunities for reflection. You know, are you actually reaching and impacting the people and communities that you anticipate, anticipate reaching or you hope to reach? Um, again, you know, if you're thinking about centering justice and equity in your research, this component is going to be crucial. So in the case of Floodsville, for example, so if the community that you had been work you were working with had been historically ignored and left out of city policies or had been consistently underfunded by the city, the impact of developing the mitigation plan to address flooding in this community and the impact of strengthening relationships between city planners and community members becomes even more significant. So this is a, a crux uh, component. Okay, we get to the question of how do you know? Um, what are the examples of evidence of change? There are a lot of ways to do this. They range from very formal to quite informal and things that you can easily do yourself with a little bit of planning and foresight. So we wanted to provide some of those examples here. Um, some really informal ways that just require you to, to, um, to catalog things. Feedback from the folks that you're working with. Maybe you're getting formal letters of recommendation or letters of partnership from people. You know, if you work with um, a particular organization, you have a good experience and they're very willing to write you a letter of recommendation or, um, or of support for funding um, in the future, that's a really nice demonstration that, uh, that they trust you, they find you credible. Informal examples of this can be emails and phone calls. Save those when you get those back. If you get a nice email from somebody that you've worked with or you get somebody asking you in-depth questions, hey, tell me more, I'm really interested in this, save that. That's a really nice example of those conceptual impacts. Your research is, is making people aware, is making people really think about these things. So they're worth hanging on to as part of, um, as part of an impacts case study. You might see something like reference to your work in a management or policy document, um, research findings cited in those documents. Um, this is a great uh, way to use either Google Scholar or Altmetric, um, both of which do a pretty good job of, of linking um, an academic publication to, um, to a management document or a policy document. So explore those tools a little bit because you might be surprised at where some of your research has ended up. And then Keep track of it, write it down. Um, feedback from the general public. If you're thinking um, you know, a little bit more formal and you're giving some talks or workshops to a general audience, do some audience surveys, um, either written or you know, raise your hands on Zoom, some poll surveys to get a sense of what people are taking away from your, um, from your presentation. Again, emails that you're getting after a talk, media interviews or reference to your work in the media, keep track of all of that. It's not just uh, something that looks nice on your CV. It's, a, it's, an, it's evidence that your work is changing people's thoughts about, um, about a topic. You can also do some really formal evaluation of your work. Um, if you are in a situation where you can work with an external evaluator, um, some of the bigger grants do require this. Pre and post tests of folks that you're working with to gauge changes in understanding in capacity, et cetera. Um, surveys and interviews in, of um, with your partners to find out 
what they liked or what they learned or how they're using that information can be really nice after the um, after the fact. Um, if you want to get really, uh, really formal and you do have um, that kind of support, you can do some randomized control trials, you know, if you want to test out a particular function with one group and um, and compare it to another. So you can really go from this, you know, relatively informal, it's a lot, you know, the, it's the, the onus is on you to collect some of that stuff to um, hiring an external evaluator to work with you and really trace these things more formally. All of these are excellent sources of evidence. This is another like slight divergence and caveat. Um, I, I want to use this little metaphor that sculptors will often talk about images emerging from the stone. They can't go in with sort of a predetermined idea. Same thing with your narrative about your work. It's not carved in stone. Um, the framework that we've presented and that we're going to share um, in the guidebook is um, it's a set of tools that we think can help us all think about and describe our work more effectively, but it's a guide. It's not a paint by numbers. So um, there's nothing in this that says, hey, uh, I have to say, use these words about my work or use exactly this way of documenting it. These should give you some ideas. Um, so use it as a guide. Okay. So all of this information is in our guidebook that was published earlier this year. Um, and this provides more in-depth background about the how and why of documenting societal impacts, as well as more examples. Um, so I'm just going to drop this link in the chat where you can download it. Um, and and then I think both of us would agree. So um, the guidebook is written, you'll see it says climate change research, natural and physical scientists. We were writing for a particular project and for a particular audience. Um, I hopefully you'll have you have seen through this that while you know some of our examples were very environment and climate based, um, they can really be applied more broadly than that. So that gets back to the idea that this is not a paint by numbers and this is not you know just to fill in the blank. Use this as a way to um, to think about your work and apply it in ways that make the most sense for you. And then we've also developed um, downloadable Google documents if you want to work through these steps in a more kind of linear uh, you know, document form. Um, so these links are in the guidebook, but I'm going to put them in the chat now too. And so these are two, one is for planning for impacts and walking through that. And then the other is documenting your impacts and reflecting on the process. Um, we also wanted to make sure to share some of our favorite resources on this. Um, we're going to uh, make sure that you all have a copy of the slides. Um, most, if not all of these are also cited in that guidebook, so you can always go and look those up. But um, these are some of the places that we go to for, um, for information um, and to get new ideas. So we just wanted to make sure that we were sharing that as well. Um, and I do think we have some time for discussion. So these are really big, broad, open questions, just questions, ideas, or thoughts about how you might use this approach um, or, you know, oh no, I don't see myself reflected in here. We've got about 15 minutes. So um, if you um, if you wanna ask a question, um, either raise your hand, yeah, raise your hand or you can drop it in the chat. And I'm gonna stop sharing just so that I can um, see everything that's going on. And maybe if um, if we haven't got uh, specific questions to start with, um, I'll start asking you some questions. Um, what are some examples of societal impacts from your own research? Maybe you hadn't thought of them that way before, but now uh, now that you think about it, you think, oh wait, yeah, I see how this this framework might work. Um, any thoughts? So I, I have some experience in evaluation and things, but the thing that I find really interesting is um, the concept about, um, was it capacity building where citizens that we're engaging with are asking more in-depth questions? And I've never really thought about that as an impact um, before. And that was just illuminating and I appreciate that. 
Yeah, thanks. I, I agree. It's um, we need to think of that. Uh, all of these are sort of building blocks, right? We can't jump all the way to somebody accepting a new policy change if we haven't had that opportunity for them to engage with the topic and think about it. And and one of the things we see is, you know, as people get oh they think they i'm thinking about this i'm wondering about this that's just a really nice example that you're connecting and that they're really wrestling with what you're talking about and i think that's i think it's an impact worth documenting and two it's been cool to watch people have like further researchable questions and like that kind of curiosity is just cool yes i think that's an excellent example thank you audrey um carrie um, yeah, great. Thanks. This is a great presentation. And, and, you know, we are underway with a current evaluation. And as we've been thinking, I, 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 I want to kind of want to echo a little bit of what Audrey just said is, I mean, I, we had thought of this idea of, of people's minds being expanded, basically, as a conceptual impact that, that they were really, we were providing information that helped them get their minds around some of the concepts around, you know, climate change and impacts on the ground, et cetera. Um, so I'll have to kind of rethink, but, but it does make sort of in sense that it's also capacity building or, or instead capacity building. So I guess I just wanted to, well, I was just making that comment and just sort of thinking out loud, I guess, and how we might yeah. Add, add to this of current evaluation that we're in the midst of in that in that regard. Yeah, Carrie, I think um, I think if I'm understanding, I, you know, I do want to draw a little bit of a distinction. There is um, there is those conceptual impacts, and we need those, right? People just understanding, people asking more in depth questions. Um, when we think about that capacity building, we want to we want to cross the line a little bit into people sort of. Um, demonstrating a new skill, demonstrating greater proficiency with this, which is I think why that um, that the Floodsville example, we talk about um, those city council members being able to explain this to somebody else. They took our slides, but they were able to explain this to somebody else. So we've moved beyond just the like, I understand it better myself. I now have a greater skill or greater proficiency in this. And I feel comfortable sharing this out um, and answering questions that somebody else might have. So they're linked. They, I think they they go together. Um, but if you you know you can talk about them separately, and you can talk about them as as sort of a continuum of a greater understanding to greater proficiency and skill. Does that make sense, Gigi? Did that? Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say to you, you know, the when you're going through kind of like piecing things out into categories, it gets a little difficult because you might you know one one impact might not fit into one or the other it might fit into kind of both and then you'll think about um how you want to capture that but the i mean that's what's really nice about kind of looking at um, a case study approach is that you can make those links it's not just like oh we're getting these numbers of <laughs> of impact it's like we're also describing how they are connected yeah exactly right thank you david yeah, thank you. I have a quick question. I'd like to hear your ideas or anyone's ideas on the connectivity. So how you maintain engagement over the years. So during the project, that's relatively easy. As the project loses its funding and it, and it continues to grow, those impacts are still occurring. But unless you have a way to converse with people and you're staying in touch, you'll never know. And so I was wondering if you had any ideas or examples of of how you've kept these research teams, you know, connected and kind of intact, so you can tap them and and get other uh, outcomes. Yeah, I you you hit the nail on a, on a very hit the head on you know what I mean a very difficult one <laughs> <laughs> because you're right because the way that so much of our research funding operates, right? We get two, maybe three years, maybe if we're really lucky, we get a five-year project and then it's over and we have to move on to something else because our salaries are tied to that. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the onus for maintaining some of those connections, it just rests on us as individuals. Um, and so that's not a satisfying or easy answer. Um, 
but it doesn't necessarily, I think, have to be a huge undertaking. If you think about, you know, being able to just mentally or, or you know, or, or in your salary, allocate a little bit of time to touching base with some key folks now and then. Um, with some of the evaluations that I work with, I suggest, you know, are you able to follow up with the quick couple of sentence, you know, couple of questions every six months or every year, just to sort of say, hey, mm -hmm. how's it going? Uh, you know, just just curious about any updates on this project. Um, I, I wish that I had a way to say, yes, we've got, uh, you know, a, a no cost, um, super easy way to do this. But unfortunately, it's um, human uh, capacity. <laughs> yeah. You know, people have privacy concerns too. I've I've thought about having email lists and kind of a, a shared place to go. But you know, people use Google to to stay in touch, touch with each other. There's not there's not the dependence on a dedicated website or mm -hmm. anything like that. So it's a challenge. Yeah. There's a, a chat question oh, I it. Um, from Amy Gibney. Um, Amy, you're welcome to, to come off mute and say it yourself if you want to, or I can read it. Yes, hi, Gigi. Hi, Allison. Hi, Amy. Um, hi. I just thought it might be helpful to think a little bit about um, the broader impacts in terms of, you know, we assess that following our projects in terms of outcomes, um, but how do you maybe prioritize some of that when you're just beginning to write about expected broader ink impacts um, when you're applying uh, to a funding agency? Gigi, do you want to talk about the planning tools in the guidebook? Yeah. I'm just, um, uh, actually, well, I just have a, a question, like a clarifying question. So, because you're saying the broader impacts in research planning versus outcomes. I mean, I think, well, I, I guess the... Um, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, you, you've, you can capture the impact that you have made after, you know, your project is enacted. Um, but what about prior to that, when you're saying we expect to do these things? Um, <laughs> Sorry, my dog. He's okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, um, I think what's important is really calling out what we an what we anticipate doing. And so using the same um, outcome categories can be really helpful to, to think through. So it's not just like, I want to change the world. <laughs> it's like, what are, you know, what are some actual specific steps we can take? Um, and, you know, if I do have this, and that's why the, the problem statement framing, especially in the, in the planning phase is so important because you're like, what is the societal problem that I'm addressing and what pieces of that can I chip away at with my project? Um, and so, you know, just, and I, I think the part two, I mean, having, having a vision in mind and like putting that on paper can actually be scary because you're like, you know, Am I committed to this? This is on paper now. Like I have to do it. And you know, I think that 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 you know, if you do any kind of work where you're trying to make societal impact, <laughs> you'll. I mean, things don't go as planned. Thing new, new, unanticipated impacts come up. Other um, things may work out differently than you expected. And I think that that you know, going into a project with that kind of flexibility in mind and ways to uh, incorporate that you know any unexpected things is really important um but it's really yeah it's just it's it's really great to get these ideas out on paper and then kind of see what happens and document it over time and then at the end you know kind of going back and be like what what did i get done and what what was new and and that's where the reflection can really be helpful if you've done the the pre-work and the post-work um it's a really rich kind of learning experience for doing your next process. Yeah, this is where that um, 
Gigi talked about at the, you know, um, early on that we sort of use this logic model framework to, to walk through this. And this is particularly in the planning stage, that's where this can really come in handy because it asks you to um, be able to draw some sort of some logical lines and some reasonable assumptions between the kinds of activities that you'd like to do and the kinds of impacts that you want to have. And maybe linking up those, those broad, you know, four societal impacts categories. If you want to have capacity building impacts, it gives you a chance to say, do I have activities, you know, in my broader impacts or societal impacts plan that that mean that I'm going to have those capacity impacts? Am I providing some training? Am I, um, you know, training to the, the folks that I really want to tackle? So um, there's, there's definitely, we presented this as sort of a backwards looking, but, um, but in the guidebook, and we'd be also happy to talk with anybody about how to do the forward looking process of this as well. Well, um, on that note, we just have a couple minutes left. So, um, you know, or we can stay on the line for a few extra minutes if anybody has further questions. Um, what I did not do was, um, and I will do that now, I'll just put up um, our contact us. If you would, if you, something comes up later or you have further questions, please feel free to get in touch. Um, Obviously, we like talking about this stuff, um, and um, and we you know we enjoy the process of brainstorming um, ideas, um, and hopefully the guidebook is helpful to you. We have some additional resources, some previous videos, and some other things available on our website rie.arizona.edu. So feel free. Yeah, to I, I just dropped a link. You were you were talking about logic models. The Kellogg Foundation has a nice logic model. Um, workbook, and I put that in the chat. If people haven't seen that, Thank it's you. really helpful. It's a great one. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, again, feel free if anybody wants to stay on for a couple minutes. I think Gigi and I can stay for a few extra minutes. If not, thanks. Um, thanks again. Thanks for coming and um, get in touch if you would like to.